I know I look like a tree. <laughs> Don't let me blend in with the background here. Amen. Let's stay focused in the Word of God. Amen. Guys, I'm really excited. Uh, today is the last day of the Olympics. Uh, I'm not excited that the Olympics are over, but the Olympics have been very exciting. And uh, America's been kicking butt. Come on, America. We got a whole lot of medals. Like, 126 I what? checked last night the next Whoa. closest is like 72 wow. it's like insane how awesome we are at sports <laughs> uh, but you know Courtney brought up a good point she said we're really good at sports but we're really bad at a lot of other stuff <laughs> <laughs> like America America is a very interesting country like we invest a lot of money in a lot of different things but a lot of what we invest our money in isn't really all that important and so what I want to do is I want to talk about something that I think America needs to understand. Okay. We need to get back to the basics. And so the title of our message this morning is Back to the Roots of Christianity. We got to talk about the roots. We've got to go back to the basics. Very often we can get caught up in theology and all these books and these authors and all these ideas. But the bottom line is the Bible says those things can become very confusing and can indoctrinate you with a lot of false understandings of the scriptures. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. so I believe one of the biggest causes of division in Christianity nowadays is all of these Christian authors. Yeah. Because everyone's got their own ideas about all these different passages, when the reality is we're all reading the same book. Come on. Come on. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, listen, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. I mean, you guys are watching miracles happen. Yes. You guys are hearing all these different languages being spoken. Yeah. You're seeing the evangelization of the world. But I've got to remind you of the three fundamentals of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And in verse 13, he says, in the end, these three will remain. When everything else passes away and everything else is destroyed, only three things are going to be left. Yeah. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break down three consecutive miracles of Jesus wow. in three consecutive chapters. Come on, bro. And we're going to look at Jesus' faith, Jesus' hope, and Jesus' love. Come on, Come bro. On. Amen? Amen. Please turn your Bible to Mark chapter 3. All right. Come on, girl. Now what we're going to read, these three things are not parables. However, for us, they can serve as allegories and lessons for us to learn from. These things are very real and they really happened. And you can even put yourself in the crowd and imagine what it would have been like to be there and understand a little bit more of what's going on. So let's get on ground level here in Mark chapter 3 and start our reading in verse 1. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot, again, plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Point number one, faith to do the impossible. Faith to do the impossible. Right here we see... This man sitting in the courts and his hand is shriveled up, but he's sitting down. Is it because he's paralyzed because he can't walk? No, his hand is just shriveled. Mm -hmm. He's fine. Why is he sitting down? He's probably been standing for a really long time and he's tired. He's probably been there for a while. Why else do people sit down? Maybe he was discouraged. Maybe he was sad. Maybe he was just sitting there whimpering, upset about a situation. Mm -hmm. But he knew Jesus was coming to town. Mm -hmm. Now this wasn't the first time Jesus healed somebody. Right. Back in Mark chapter 1, the title of one of the passages is, Jesus has healed many. Right. So Jesus has done lots of miracles at this point. 
He's healed tons of people. So when this man with a shriveled hand hears that Jesus is, is, is coming to town, he starts to get some faith. He finds himself over in the synagogue and he's just waiting on Jesus' arrival. Jesus walks over and all of the religious leadership is watching intently on this situation. It's the Sabbath. It's the day of rest. Miracles should not be done on the day of rest. Mm -hmm. And Jesus looks at this man. He cares enough about this guy. <laughs> he challenges the religious leadership. And he commands this guy to stand up. Did that heal him? No. Has he stood up before? Yeah, probably a lot of times. <laughs> right? But Jesus goes, stand up. And then he tells him, stretch out your hand. Mm -hmm. You think he had never tried to stretch out his hand before? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that he had never sat there for hours mm -hmm. trying to come up with the strength to just stretch out his hands? Mm -hmm. Trust me, if your hand was shriveled up, you would have been trying to do the same thing. Right. So something made this situation very different. Mm. Look over in Mark mm. chapter 11. Mm. This is the only other time in the book of Mark that the Bible uses the word shriveled. In Mark chapter 11, we'll read here in verse 20. In the morning as they went along, they saw a fig tree withered. In the Greek, that's the same word as shriveled. It means to be dried up. Withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Mm -hmm. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So you, so that your Father in Heaven may forgive your sins. Mm -hmm. Right here we see another term, another, another time that the word shriveled is being used. And this time it's in reference to a tree, specifically its roots. Right. Mm -hmm. So what was the root of the issue with this man with the shriveled hands? Was the root that he had never tried to stretch it out before? No. The root of the issue was a lack of faith. Mm -hmm. You see, Jesus looked at this tree with withered roots and he makes it an issue of faith. And Come he tells on. him, listen, if you have faith, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. You see that mountain over there, Peter? You can pick it up and throw it into the sea. You see right here? Well, you can't really see it now. You can literally pick it up and throw it into the sea. Wow. That's pretty incredible. That'd be all over the news. Come on. <laughs> that would be. You'd get very famous very fast. You'd be asked to do a whole lot more cool stuff. Right? <laughs> right? And so the issue with this man and the shriveled hand, the, the issue is very simple. He did not have faith to do the impossible. Mm. But Jesus comes into his presence and all of a sudden he's filled with faith and he's ready to see a miracle happen. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. You know, guys... We can have faith to see the impossible take place as well. Your faith makes all the difference. You know, uh, right now it's spider season and uh, in our house we got lots of spiders. Big ones, little ones, and really big ones. And last night Gina prayed an impossible prayer because they've been crawling around her room and around the hall to get to her room. The other night we found one about the size of your palm. Whoa, no way. Yeah, with its legs stretched out. I have pictures of it. And the girls were screaming. It's on Facebook. And Gina prayed an impossible prayer. Last night she said, God, I pray that I don't see any spiders tonight. She went to bed without seeing one spider. Now, now the lady didn't so the lady didn't have enough faith. Oh, oh, lady. So the lady comes home. They live in our basement. <laughs> that sounds really bad. It's very finished. Yeah. It has carpet and stuff. <laughs> so the lady comes home and she goes, you know what? A prayer is not going to make a difference. Oh, and she walks yeah. down the hall and oh, there it is wow. on the wall. Right in front of me. A gigantic spider 
she freaks out and she runs upstairs and sleeps on her couch. <laughs> Delaney, it's okay to pray impossible prayers. <laughs> You know, last year, uh, my wife prayed an impossible prayer. She's got lots of family here in Seattle, and most of her family isn't really church going, and so she prayed, Lord, just give us a cranking church in Seattle. Yeah. She started praying that January 1st of 2015, and in October of that year, she got the phone call, hey, a church is being planted in Seattle, and you're gonna go on the church. <laughs> an impossible prayer. You know, for me, I'm very grateful for all the incredible brothers in our church, but it's always exciting when the church can continue to grow. And so I prayed right before the GLC, Lord, send us a really cranking brother from one of the other churches. I just got a phone call a couple days ago from his brother. He's an intern over in Boston. Come he on. goes, Joel, I'm moving to Seattle in less than two weeks. Oh, wow. Yay! Oh, man. Some of you guys are like, well, who is it? <laughs> Danny Gardner. Oh, yeah. Really awesome brother. Uh, maybe some of you guys need to start praying to, to be fruitful. It's been a while since you've been able to bring someone on in to God's kingdom and be used by God in that way. Pray to be fruitful. Maybe you need to pray to have a better job. Maybe you're just not satisfied with your work. Come on. You can pray an apostle prayer. Lord, give me a better job. That's right. You can. You know, you can you can pray for a stronger marriage. Any marrieds here? Yes. <laughs> I know sometimes it seems impossible. Impossible But the Lord can give you a strong marriage. Or a marriage. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, guys, we got to be willing to pray these prayers. Why do we not pray them? Is it because we don't think about them? No. It's because we don't have the faith that they're actually going to come true, and yeah. we don't want to be disappointed. Yeah, come on. Oh, come on. So we guard our hearts, and we just say, you know what? Scrap that prayer. I don't want to see God fail in my life. I'd rather keep believing God's awesome. I know it's not going to come true anyways. And you don't pray the prayer. I want to encourage you. Pray the prayer. God might say no, or he might say yes. But you've got to have the faith to say the words. Come on, bro. This is awesome. You know, um... Last week, we got an email from Carlos Mejia, who leads our church in Mexico City. And he's got this couple on staff down there, uh, an amazing couple in the church, um, named Lionel and Christina. They have a 14-year-old son, Diego. And he sent out an email last week that the doctors believe he had pulmonary lymphoma, which is basically lung cancer. And it's nearly untreatable. And so he sends this email out to all the church leaders in the movement around the world. And we all had a day of prayer and most of us fasted for that one day. Well, we just got an email Friday Come night. On. The doctors were wrong. Whoa. It's not pulmonary lymphoma. It's just okay. another germ cell cancer. Wow. And it can be removed with a quick surgery. Come on. Come on. And uh, Come on. Diego's getting better and now he's studying the Bible. Wow. We've got to be willing to say the impossible prayers and believe they're going to come true. Yeah. Faith to do the impossible. <laughs> Point number two, there is hope when Jesus is in the boat. Come on. <laughs> Look over in Mark chapter 4. Verse 35. That day when Evie came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves, sorry, the wind's blowing my, my Bible, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the waves died down and it was completely calm. Then he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Guys, if you're a Christian, then you believe that Jesus is in your boat. Sometimes he may be sleeping. It's okay to sleep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Jesus may be sleeping. Amen. But just because presently he's not doing miracles doesn't mean he's not still in your life. Yeah. Just because he doesn't say yes to your prayers 
doesn't mean he's not still in your life. There's always hope when Jesus is in the boat. And the fact is, whatever happens in the boat to those guys is also going to happen to Jesus. You think Jesus would let that boat drown? Those guys drown, the boat break? Do you think he would ever let that happen? Of course not. So we can be confident that it's not too much to handle. Come on, Joel. Where do these storms come from? I want to tell you that the storms of life are caused by sin. They're caused by sin. Sin causes these storms. When wind is blowing, when the waves are crashing, and you hear the wood crack, and you feel like it's going to topple over, you start to feel swamped, there's still hope. Come on. Because Jesus is in the boat. He's not going to let it sink. It's so funny. These guys are freaking out. They're freaking out. I believe this was not just a doubt that Jesus could calm the storm. This was a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah altogether. Because they believed that Jesus was going to allow himself to drown. Therefore, he can't be the savior of the world. This was a huge doubt. This wasn't just like, hey, don't bother waking up Jesus because he can't calm the storm. This was a, maybe Jesus is human after all. And he doesn't have the power to do anything about this storm. Mm. And they're freaking out. They go down there. They wake him up. Jesus, don't you care if we die? Mm -hmm. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him right away. He goes, okay, I'll handle this. Goes upstairs, calms the storm. And then he calms the guys down. And he goes, where was your faith? Mm. You still don't believe. Okay. All right, come on. You see the patience mm -hmm. of Jesus. Why? Because... He had hope. Right. Not that every storm would be calmed, but hope that these guys could change. Right. He still believed in them. They were still his 12. They've already been appointed. He still believed wow. that they could change and do great things. Mm. You know, I think for some of us, the rocking in your boat is going on right now. Mm. And maybe you're starting to freak out a little bit. But you've got to understand, Jesus is in the boat too. And he's not going to let this thing go under. Come on, bro. The only thing that's going to let it go under is your lack of faith and your lack of hope. Come on. Bro. You know, Jesus Jesus could have calmed the boat or calmed the storm. But these guys, they, they didn't want to go wake them up. You know, when you're going through the trials of life, you're going through these storms, you're going through hardship, just go wake up Jesus. Have a conversation with Jesus. He's going to fix the problem. Wow. He's letting it be a trial. I think the reality is we've got to realize that Jesus is in the stern. And therefore, the problem can be fixed. No self-help book is going to fix your problem. Right. Yeah. No self-help book. No amount of fun activities. No, no amount of group of, of awesome friends. Right. These, 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 these things are not going to fix your problems. Only Jesus can calm the storm. Yeah. Come on, bro. Only Jesus has that power. You know, Alan Redpath, a very famous author, he wrote one of his books. It says, sin takes power out of service, mm. takes the spring out of your step, mm. takes the joy out of your life, mm. takes the testimony out of your lips, and takes the peace out of your heart, mm. and leaves an awful paralysis mm. of soul. You see, sin is very destructive in nature. It causes storms. Sin makes a storm a storm. Faith makes a storm a lullaby. Jesus was asleep in the middle of the storm. The same rocking that was freaking these guys out put Jesus to sleep. Come on. It's about our perspective. Right. It's about how we view the situation. It's about how much we believe and how much hope that we have that things can change and be different. You know, I'm pretty excited about the Northwest family of churches. Come on. Yes. I, mean, I, I talk to Caesar and Brian, the guys who lead uh, Portland and Eugene. I talk to them every day. And great things are happening in Portland and Eugene. You know, and uh, 
in uh, Portland last last week. They had this uh, this incredible uh, uh, miracle happen. This uh, sister Fran had been praying for her niece for years to become a disciple. And after after praying for years and years and years, this impossible prayer that maybe one day she'd become a disciple. Just this past Wednesday, Wednesday she baptized her niece. Wow. Yeah. And very excitingly in Portland, they're going to have another baptism today. Amen. Yeah. You know, very exciting what's going on down in Eugene. Come on, yeah. Come on. I mean, Eugene's cranking right now. Yeah. They had this incredible young man baptized last week named Dakota. On, sold out disciple. This guy's fired up about his relationship with Come God. On. He's doing so well. But this one woman was at the baptism. Uh, she works for Mary Kay. She was reached out to by her sister, Raina. And this girl comes on out. She sees Dakota's baptism. She's so inspired by it. She goes to Joali and some of the other girls. She goes, hey, what does it take to get baptized in your church? I want to be a disciple too. Wow. She's been doing two Bible studies every single day this whole week. Wow. She's doing a couple more today because she wants to get baptized this afternoon. Amen. Wow. God's doing incredible things. There is hope when Jesus is in the boat. Come on. Point number three, perfect love has no limits. Let's go to Mark chapter five and see the next miracle here in verse one. They went across the lake to a region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came to the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me? Jesus said to the Most High God, In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported the town and the countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, he saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let them, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. <laughs> He had made a decision, I'm going to fix this problem. 
I'm gonna drive these demons out of this guy. And so that's what he does. He goes out there, talks to them, has a conversation with demons, and just tells them simply, get out of that guy. The demons get scared of Jesus. Right. And they go, well, send us somewhere. Let us do something destructive. <clears throat> and so, <laughs> they see these pigs up on a the countryside. They're like, at least send us into those pigs. Jesus looks up. It's like, wow. This is a pretty expensive exorcism. <laughs> this is going to cost a lot and a lot of money. Yeah. It's worth it. This guy's going to get healed. The owners of these pigs are going to get kind of ticked off, but this, this guy needs salvation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can go into the pigs. Jesus took that on himself. The people, when they show up, they're not mad at the demons. They're not, they're not mad at the demons. They're mad at Jesus. They're scared of Jesus because of the cost that it took to heal this guy. It would have been much easier to listen to the screams at night and to let their children be scared than to lose 2,000 pigs from their herd. That's intense. That's intense. That's at least 2,000 demons. You know what I'm saying? That's a legion right there. The entire herd jumps off the cliff. I don't know if pigs jump. They fall off the cliff, roll off the cliff, and die. That's an expensive exorcism. You know, guys, there is no price Jesus was unwilling to pay for the salvation of someone's soul. Wow, yeah. I think sometimes we put limits on our love. We go, I'll spend this much time with somebody. I'll spend this much money on somebody. I'll pray this much for somebody. But after that, I got to cut it off. That's too much money. That's too much time. That's too much sacrifice. That's too much prayer. They clearly don't want to change. And we put a limit. We put conditions on our love. Jesus had a perfect love. And it was never too expensive to save a soul. He was willing to do whatever it took to save a person's soul. Come on. Did Jesus' plan work? It worked. Yeah. The demons, yeah, they killed some pigs. But this guy got saved. Yeah. And because of him, lots of other people got saved. How do we know that? He became a preacher. And he goes into the Decapolis, yeah. a, a, an area of about 10 cities, and he becomes the region leader. Come on of those cities. This is incredible. Yeah. This is an incredible story. Yeah. Now, pretty interestingly, there's another account in the Gospels of the same story. Mm -hmm. But in that parallel account, it says there were two guys possessed by demons. Right what happened? Where's the other guy? Why did Mark not talk about him? Most commentators would say it's because he didn't repent, and he didn't want to follow Jesus. Wow. So Mark said, forget that guy. I want to share this guy's story. Oh, wow. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. You know, for me, I know when I became a Christian, I had a lot of demons driven out of me, a lot of impure spirits. I mean, my struggles were very obvious. Lots of struggles. Selfishness, laziness, pride, lust. I was a very anxious person. I cared a lot about what people thought. I really tried to please a lot of people. Those are a lot of different demons. Yeah. I mean, this guy, you, you see that he's got a major issue. He's showing signs. I, I, I read a, a study on this passage one time. The psychologist took a look at it. And he says, this guy is showing signs of insanity, depression, and anxiety. Have you ever struggled with these, these, these things? You may, you may be told by a doctor that it's one thing or another. The Bible just calls it demon possession. Yeah. 
That's intense. Yeah. Yeah. That's intense. Very intense. But you know what? Anybody can chase. Yeah. yeah. Anybody can chase. Any demon can be driven out by Jesus. Any miracle can happen. And your soul was worth it. You know, Jesus had no limits on how much he would love people. And you know, for us guys, we're going to take communion here in a couple minutes. And there's, and there's no limit to how much Jesus loves us. Mm. There's no limit. There's no cost too much to save your soul. Mm. There's nothing Jesus isn't willing to give up or to do to save you. Think of who you were when you were called. Not many of us were wise by human standards. Right. Not many of us had a whole lot going for us spiritually. Right. And the Bible says God loves us so much, he rescued us from that lifestyle. Right. He drove those demons out. Come on. To give us hope and to show us his love. Right. Guys, these three will remain. Faith, hope, and love. Mm -hmm. Let's have faith to do the impossible. Let's have faith. Let's say the things that we want. Let's pray those impossible prayers for the people that we thought could never change. For the areas in our life that we thought could never change. Right. Pray the impossible prayers. Yeah. Let's have the hope that Jesus had. Remember that if Jesus is in your boat, you're a Christian, you're following Jesus. Right. He's with you in it to the end. There's hope. Yeah. Come on. Don't give up. Yeah. Don't give in. There's hope. Yeah. And remember the love that Jesus yeah. gave you when he died on the cross and he stretched out his hands and he took the pain for your, for your salvation. He took the pain to save your soul. Amen? Amen. Let's say a prayer here for the community. Father God, we just want to come before you, God, thankful for the opportunity to know you, God, to talk to you, to pray to you, to fellowship, to get to know each other. Father, uh, we're just so grateful for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We're so grateful, God, for the sacrifices that have been made for our souls. God, I remember studying the Bible for those two years and those brothers pouring so much time and effort into my life and helping me to become a Christian. I'm so grateful, God. I pray that we can take this time to remember the bread being broken as Jesus' body was broken for us on the cross. As we drink the juice that represents his blood spilled for us on the cross, help us to make it very personal because it is personal so that we can walk in step with the Spirit and be close to you. We love you, God. It's in your son's name that we pray.